Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at what the Advent themes of love, joy, and today, peace, have to tell us about our God, who is missional and his heart. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, Kath led us to consider how the love of the Father for all humanity he gave birth to this plan of restitution and reconciliation of the world to him through the birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Juliet talked last week about the joy that was present during the time leading up to Jesus' birth through the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives and the responses of Elizabeth and Mary and Zachariah. And today I'm going to elaborate on the peace the birth of Jesus brings to the world as the Prince of Peace, bringing God's kingdom of peace to earth as it is in heaven. Over recent days, much has been reported of situations where the absence rather than the presence of peace has been in evidence. We only need to look within our own village to know and to remember and to think about some of those situations. We see events in our, world, our, our wider context and in the wider world. And we see the absence of God's peace rather than the presence. And as but we will see that the peace that Jesus brings is one of unity and harmony. It's of a common source, a common cause, and a common goal in Christ. It's at the, the peace that Jesus brings and brought at Christmas, the, the peace that the angels foretold was a peace for the nations, for warring people and relationships, and for the personal peace that comes from being reconciled to God himself in our own lives. So we've got two, th two three readings, sorry, today. The first reading and the, and the last reading are well-known Christmas um, readings that we, that we read frequently at this time of year, and the middle one isn't. And they will all give us some aspect and share some points about the peace that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings to the world. The Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. That time. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. There will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. He will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Mm -hmm. Isaiah wrote those words in the middle of Judah's 8th, 8th century BC war with Syria and the northern Jewish kingdom of Israel. For Isaiah, at the time, the threat of loss and exile was all around. And yet, through him, God speaks words of hope and deliverance. Hope that a new day would appear to heal the divisions between Judah and Israel and uphold the kingdom with justice and with righteousness. And the passage opens with images highlighting the joy of reversal. There is light after darkness. There is harvest after hunger. There is division of plunder after battle. 
but this flows into the celebration of that central reversal, the end of oppression leading to freedom, life after the threat of death. Isaiah looks forward to the completion of the enemy's destruction, but affirms that its seeds have already been sown, the yoke already broken through the birth of a child. The child that shares God's wisdom, power and eternal being, while his reign will be marked by the key characteristics of peace, justice and righteousness. The Christians, Jesus is the child who fulfills this prophecy. Even though his physical coming didn't immediately get rid of the Roman Empire or any of the other oppressive regimes that have sprung up ever since. The kingdom the birth of Jesus ushers in is a kingdom without end. A kingdom that lies beyond the earthly realm of power struggles and politics. Yet, is somehow also present alongside all of that. It's a kingdom which holds intention being present now, but which will come in all its fullness when Jesus returns to reign in glory at the end of time. Sadly, darkness and division have not gone away. So the longed for light is still desperately needed today. For many people, our world is a scary place. There's plenty of war and exile and destruction. And we know the fear, the very real fear that is present in our world at the moment because of the coronavirus and its ever-evolving mutations. And just as it must have been hard for Isaiah to remain hopeful as his world, the world he knew, fell apart, it can feel impossible to hold fast to God's ultimate faithfulness in today's world. And it's into this sadly and unfortunately familiar world of fear and violence that the Prince of Peace brings the Advent message that where he is, then peace follows, and that the ways of peace can be found when those involved look to him. Our ultimate hope is that when Jesus comes to reign in glory, then all wars and hostilities will end, for his presence will be all around and within every heart. In the kingdom of God, there is no room for war and destruction, for fear. There is only room for peace. And that hope of peace brought by Jesus is for us now, as well as being a hope for the future. The cap is going to bring us the second of the readings, which is most definitely not a normal, typical Christmas reading. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God 
by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. And that's a reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10 to 20 to 21. Now I'm entitled that the Prince of Peace unites all people who are in Christ, and his peace is available to all. In this passage, Paul reflects on the unity that Christ, the Prince of Peace, brings. Because all have sinned and fallen short of God's values, all are equal in God's eyes. In that passage, the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus came to save the whole world, so that all who believe in him can have eternal life. According to Paul, for those who are in Christ, there can be no divisions because of ethnicity, culture, or religious background. Gentle, Gentile believers were first asked to imagine themselves as they might be perceived from a Jewish perspective. They did not belong to the elect nation and had no hope. However, Christ has drawn them in, not into the old religious context, but into a new relationship of peace. Christ not only reconciled people to God, but also to one another. And the final verses of that passage use some strong images. Christians are not aliens, but citizens, and are members of God's household. Together, whatever their ethnic or religious original background, they are built into a new temple. And in this building image, there is a contrast between the dividing wall, which kept people apart, and the new structure, which incorporated them and gave them all access to God and symbolised a different reality. The passage emphasises the work of Christ in making one humanity, with the abolition of the fundamental categories that divide people. The passage emphasises that the peace Jesus brings reconciles people to each other in unity and harmony. It's a peace that's for the here and now. In Jesus, the author of peace, we have the means to bring peace to our relationships, both within and outside the church. The promise of Advent peace is for all relationships, where Jesus is brought into the conflict. Wherever we go, each one of us, the Prince of Peace goes with us, bringing his peace, his joy, and his love. If you go back to the first part, Thank you. There's one bit that, as, as, as Kath was reading this, I just thought so much that actually this is the world. Okay? You lived in this world without God and without hope. And that really sort of jumped out at me as part of that theme before. That's where a lot of people are living. They're living in this world without God and therefore without hope. But there is that chance that those who come to know Jesus, that if someone goes and gives them the message, then they can, to, can come to know him. And they can be united with Christ Jesus. They were once, like us, were far away from God but now have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. And that's really one that continues that sense of, of peace and of mission of God in sending Jesus, the Prince of Peace. He brings peace to the world, to, war, to warring nations, that larger scale conflict. He brings peace to relationships with each other. There might be peace between, it might be people groups. It might be divisions in the church. On a personal level, it's our own relationships that we make. But as the Prince of Peace is with us and within us, then we take him to bring his peace to all of those relationships where there is friction 
and where there is conflict. Just going to have a short prayer. Jesus came and stood among the disciples saying, peace be with you. Lord, where there are families in distress, help us walk beside them saying, peace be with you. Lord, in the playground or park, where children fight or disagree, put us among them to say, peace be with you. Lord, where there is stress in the workplace and tension between colleagues, make us present to say, peace be with you. Give us your peace, Lord, and make us peacemakers. Amen. And as I was praying that prayer, it came to, Angie came to my mind as someone who is there, not necessarily in the playground, but she's in the park. She's where young people will bring in discord um, and and disunity to our community and to their own relationships. She is there and she is bringing God's peace to those situations, but it's really hard for her. I know she's not here this morning. She's at the URC this morning. She's at the URC this morning. So we just, um, just, I'm just gonna spend a moment just praying for Angie. Mm -hmm. as, our, as our youth worker, as our visible representative of the Prince of Peace, bringing peace to a to a community wherever and whenever she can. And over the last week, certainly she's been um, it, it's been really taxing for her. And we just thank you, God, that uh, Friday's youth club was really good, mm -hmm. um, and um, it it went a long way to to make up for the awful week that she'd had before. Mm -hmm. And we just lift her to you this morning. As she brings your word to the people in the URC. We pray for a real anointing of your spirit upon her, especially, Father, your, your spirit of peace. Father, we pray that you will walk with her and within her to all the situations she finds herself in, which are situations which uh, most of us would shy away from and wouldn't dream of entering. But, Father, she goes. She goes out of love for people, and for the young people in particular. She goes because she knows you have called her. Mm -hmm. And Father, we just lift her to you and ask that this Christmas time, she might be filled especially with your peace mm -hmm. uh, for her own sake and for the sake of those who, into whose contact she comes, mm -hmm. with whom she shares you. Whether she says it in words or not, she shares you in every conversation she has because she is with you and you are with her and where you, where you are when your word is and father we just thank you for all that you do through Angie. Amen. Our third reading is a familiar one. Ian's going to read that to us. It's chapter Luke chapter 2 verses 1 to 20. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. 
she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Saviour, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you'll recognise him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Thanks be to God. The long reading was just that little bit in the middle which I'd highlighted. The Prince of Peace brings peace with God to those who belong to him. So we're going to zoom in on just one brief verse to complete the trilogy of relationships which the presence of Jesus brings peace to, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favour rests. That begs the question, I suppose, who does God's favour rest upon? And the answer to that, of course, we found in the reading from the Ephesians. Jesus was born into this world with a purpose, one purpose only, to reconcile man to God, as we sing so often in our carols, in our songs. And he reconciled man to God by showing us what God is like, through his example of the life he lived, the care he poured out on others, the compassion he had for those who others would ignore or divide or they scorn upon. Through his example of how he conducted himself, how he interacted with other people, how he interacted with authority, what he stood firm on, what things angered him, where he had compassion. He reconciled man to God through his death on the cross and the resurrection. So God's favour rests on those who believe in Jesus as Son of God and have given their lives to him. That's who the angels were talking about. And God's peace can be found in God's presence with us, whatever we face, good times and bad. The myriad of trials and troubles that seem to come our way. And as I said before, as God's people of peace, we take his peace wherever we go, bringing his peace to broken relationships and to a broken and sometimes violent and selfish world. We take too his message, not just his presence, but his message, that all people can be reconciled to God through belief in his son. 
So let the angels' song sing out loud and clear the advent message of peace, so that God's kingdom of peace is experienced on earth, just as it is in heaven, and just as it will be absolutely when Jesus comes to reign again in fullness and glory. We bring our prayers for the world. God, who longs for peace, we live in a divided and broken world, a world where people march not always for peace, but to proclaim their sectarianism and their rights. A world where people have lost faith in political protest and resort to blowing up themselves and the neighbours they hate. A world where soldiers are called peacekeepers and bombs are dropped in the name of national and international security. God, who longs for peace, give us the wisdom to see both sides of the story. God, who longs for justice, we live in an unfair and unjust world. A world where supermarkets get bigger and bigger, while local farmers grow poorer and poorer. A world where the haves get richer and richer, and the have-nots have less and less. A world where the centre of the Industrial Revolution lies polluted and half derelict. Yet, still we do not learn. God, who longs for justice, give us the courage to challenge our unjust systems. God, who longs for healing and wholeness, we live in a fragile and broken world. A world where species are dying and becoming extinct, while we continue to pollute and destroy their habitats. A world where victims are forced to, relieve, to relive their terror if they are ever to receive justice from our courts. A world of vicious cycles and circles, where the abused all too easily become the abusers of themselves or of others. God, who longs for healing and wholeness, give us the love to persevere when all else fails. In the name of the one who dares us to dream peace into being, in the name of the one who shows, up, shows us creative ways to challenge injustice, and the name, in the name of the one whose love embraces all, in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we bring these our prayers to you, O Lord. Amen. Thinking of the last lines of that song, pour out your spirit on us today. Is it any wonder really that those themes that we've looked at this the Advent time of love and joy and peace, should be the first three of those gifts and fruits of the Spirit, which when Jesus' Spirit is poured out on us, those are the, gift, the fruits that we will bear. The gifts of love and of joy and of peace, patience, kindness, gentleness and self-control. All facets of Jesus, but those three, love, joy and peace, are our message this Advent time. God of peace. We pray for peace throughout the world. Help us to be peacemakers and to set things right where there is disagreement and violence. Show us the way of peace in our own lives and in our own homes, our schools, streets and workplaces, in every place we go. Amen. Amen. Amen.